Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our podcast, Beyond the White Noise. As you all know, we've been hammering the advertising this week for our guest, Kieran O'Keefe. Dr. Kieran O'Keefe's come on, he's kindly said he's up for an interview. Um, a lot of people are going to know who he is from the likes of Most Haunted, um, most certainly from this side of the, of the muddy puddle, uh, over on the other side in America, where we've got our American co-host, Kurt Logston. On my That's side it. of the muddy puddle, we've got Morris Gunnery. He's our he's our tech expert, and myself, Aaron O'Rourke. We, you know, we don't have a script or anything like that. You know, through listening to us previously via blog talk and on here, that we pretty much wing our way right right the way through this. Bit of banter, in, <laughs> little bit of banter in between. Um, so yeah, you know, let's let's make make for interest and see what's going on. Yeah, so. Uh, Mo, what, right. what, what's been happening with you, bud? Before we go any further, I'm just going to point out that monitoring the chat room right now has been Stephen Foy, or BTW Entity. He's our media manager. He deals with the YouTube channel. He monitors everything that we do or stops us getting in trouble as well, which is really good. I'm quite impressed by the fact that we may go and say something and Steve's like the mother he goes, don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> I'm just disappointed, be very careful. So yeah, so Steve's monitoring the chat room. So if anybody's got any questions, if you want to come into the chat room, or if you've got any questions through the YouTube channel, if you mention it to Stephen, or Stephen's on both chat rooms, I'll make sure that my chat rooms are open on my machines as well. Any questions that come through that you want us to pass to Kieran, or you want me to pass to any of the guys, please do. And back to the original question of what Adam's just asked me, what the hell have I been up to this week? Um, I've been playing with drones as simple as it is, I've been playing with quad cop. There's nothing paranormal, drones, and you know, you come, you come from a, you come from a background of the paranormal and technology. And the first thing you start doing is you look at one technology, you look at another concept, and you think, hmm, could I mount, like mount some form of night vision to a drone, and would it actually come in useful in an investigation? And then a couple of seconds later, you think. That's a pretty big waste of a thousand pound. You've got to be but very it's also careful. a very good idea. It's something we could look <laughs> it's a, it's to say Your employer would be so gracious as to. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. say lend it to you. Um, it. No, that wouldn't happen. That maybe, wouldn't happen maybe, a, maybe a broken one. Well, my, put it this way: my success rate, if you were to monitor, like you know, put it into a percentage of success rate of flying them things, <laughs> is pretty low. <laughs> it's unfortunately. Yeah, it's just about walk and talk at the same time, really. Know, yeah. Circular paper and crayons for me. Nevertheless, oh, Kate, what, what's new with you, Kate? Uh, Amazon. Dude, oh. I got packages coming like every single day now. Uh, stuff I don't need, basically, for I got to get together more camera stuff. I'm kind of getting more odds and ends to do with cameras and stuff like oh, that. Oh, you got your new trail cam, didn't you? You got the trail cam. Yeah, I got a new trail cam, and uh, I was excited. You know, I was really stoked. Um, I saw it on eBay or I saw it on Amazon and it said stealth. I got two trail cams, which I like to use trail cams at nights. It's easier to set up on a tree. You buy a lock, yes. you put it around it, and you can go. But this one came and it was like the mini me of trail cams. And I'm going, where are the buttons on this thing? Well, being thick headed as myself, sometimes I am. I'm looking at it, I'm opening it up, checking out where the batteries, eight double A's, and all that, and then I figure out there are buttons on front, but they're all in camouflage, and there's no letters on it. You just gotta press it. So, and I gotta sit there, and I That's just pull. Cool. <laughs> it, it's it's bad, dude. It's bad. But aside from that, now I'm trying to get some stuff together. I got uh, some video. I gotta send your guys' way and stuff like that that we did. Yes. In a couple investigations. And yeah. um, I was out in Missouri, and I got a couple invest. We did a couple uh, investigations out there. I want to get the video up out to you guys and uh, let you guys take a look at it, see what you can put together, and oh, yes. so we can kick off with some new video. Super. Oh. And for you, Mr. O'Rourke, where are we? Oh, oh mate, I, I've, I'll be honest. I've, I've had a busy week. It's been a, it's, it's been bad, really. I've just found out my car is going to cost me 900 quid to fix. Mm. Yeah. Um, needless to say, not happy. Um, yeah. Other than that, I'm waking up every morning. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm taking regular you've got, breaths. You've got you know. that going for you, which is nice. That's always a bonus, yeah. You know, it's it's, it's a thrill to wake up every morning and realise yeah. that my car's going to cost me 900 quid. Yeah, it's good. I want to cry, I really do. I want to cry. But, you know, other than that, uh, today I've been quite busy. I've been 
well, over the last week or so, actually, I've been quite busy t- uh, trying to sort out some new guests for for more of our weekly shows. Um, I've got a few p- possibly uh, in the pipeline. Uh, I'm waiting to hear back off one, um, which I'm hoping is going to be tomorrow, um, which, which is going to be another absolute cracking guest for us to to be bringing on to get another viewpoint from and to learn to learn from really yeah. um so yeah it's things are going with, things are going quite well in that respect um we've also got part two of our secret um under well not secret undisclosed location coming up on friday um yes. You know, so we've I've got that got that to look forward to also. More, um, more filming. You, you can look forward to that. I'm going to dread it because the more you look forward to it, I'm the one who's got days of battery charging. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a mucky job. Clearing. It's a mucky job. I know that, mate. And you know, I appreciate it. But the, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my car. <laughs> no, I'm getting my car back Tuesday. Um, so it, it's that's going to be the proper test for it to see whether or not Citroen have done a good job or whether or not they've well and truly done me for 900 quid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't care as long as it gets me back home. No yes, thanks. that's all that counts. <laughs> it matters. I don't care as long as I get back and my equipment's safe. Yeah. So, It'll be I'll safe. I'll I can guarantee yeah. you that. It'll be safe. I can't guarantee you the trip home. <laughs> I can't even yeah, guarantee I'll you the trip push there yet. <laughs> Can you push a car? You got the pushing car, yeah? It, it's great going downhill. Great going yeah. down. Yeah, it is. It, it's well, absolutely amazing. <sighs> Nevertheless, onwards and upwards. I mean, where the paranormal is concerned at the moment in the news, it's weird to say that in the news there's pretty much nothing paranormal. The only things that have actually appeared in the news at the moment is a, a, a picture of an image of a girl who apparently has a Japanese soldier stand behind her. Has any of you guys seen it? No. Nah. Yes, you can, yes. you can make out the boots at the bottom mm. of the girl's leg or something like that, and then yes, apparently another picture was taken right after, and it wasn't there. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird one. Now, of all the pieces of um, evidence that you, you ever come across, it's always the pieces that look too good to be true that the news seems to jump on. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm going to bring it up for you. I mean, I think I think now more more than ever, really, for for people in our position who go out investigating and things like that, I think you have got to be careful with what you're actually looking at now because, you know, advances in technology, make, you, you, you could put anything in there and make it look legit. I, mean, I couldn't. Do you know what I mean? It'd <laughs> be a crayon drawn. Right. Are, you cool, are you cool if I just bring the image up? Yeah, yeah. go for it, mate. Right, guys, give me two seconds then. I no, say give me two seconds. It's never that simple with me. So it's, uh, it's the whole walking and talking thing again, isn't it? Yeah, I'm <laughs> in the falling. There you go, guys. Oh, I've yeah, seen yeah. that. Bit. Okay, I've seen right. That. If you look very closely, um, you can see obviously two boots. Which, yeah, that's pretty obvious. There's two boots behind the girl. I'm gonna give you a little spoiler. Follow the mouse. Follow the mouse. Follow the mouse. Follow to the shit leave, which is just behind the girl. Oh. Yeah. Yes. I see. Um, <laughs> Didn't even see this. Didn't see there's that. A technical there's a technical term for, for, for paper back media, you know, like the newspapers and the tabloids, right? We call that a brain fart. That's when you do something, maybe maybe you shouldn't have posted it. Now, I can understand that maybe people are going to see this image and they're going to think, okay, there's something going on behind that girl. But yet there is somebody, there's obviously somebody standing behind it, but you're on a beach. Don't expect to be the only person on a beach. And it maybe somebody's took the perfect image, we'll call it the perfect image, and then all of a sudden that's gospel. If you understand, if you can get what I mean, guys, it's they grab it, they hand it to the newspaper, the newspaper, and publish it with a really, really catchy line. So everyone's like, "Yep, that's definitely a ghost." And to be fair, it, it's probably not a Japanese soldier. It's probably a guy on a beach standing there trying to photo bomb a young girl or something. Well, I mean, to, to be to be fair, on the other side of things, you know that could be the back of the girl's shirt. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 genu- it genuinely could be, you know, but. Uh... You know, it's okay. It's not looking likely. I agree, but you know, the, the best part is the top of the daily. You know, yeah. The, the the best part is the top of the Daily Mail's um, headline. Literally, the sub sub the sub. Um, what was the word? Just like the, the sub comments underneath it is: Are these the ghostly disembodied boots of a samurai soldier? <laughs> no. Maybe. No, no news go away. 
Mm. You know, a little bit earlier on, I said to Adam, I don't want to be in this planet anymore. That's why. That's exactly why. We put our heart and soul and effort and money and time for nothing into the paranormal. We look as much as we can towards what's going on out there. And then all of a sudden, some dude takes a photograph, posts it up, and the Daily Mail grab it and run with it. Literally run with it. And nah, nah. It could be worse. Yeah. It could be worse. It, it could have been front page news on the Daily Sport. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. But nevertheless, I mean, that's where we're up to in life. That, that I can't believe that's all that's out in paranormal news. You'd be surprised. Every once in a while, someone gets like a, a selfie, a big photo or something like that, and then the world runs with it. And then all oh, the only thing they can pull up is a, a photo bomb in well, Japan. Well, Bigfoot... I, that's another thing. I'm like, yeah, that's 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 been killed. That's been killed in the U.S. Dude, I mean, so, I mean, it's still a popular topic, though, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly the same as the Loch Ness monster. Nessie, yeah. If there's an ele- if there's an element of doubt behind something, people will look for it. I mean, Lee Brickley, Black Eyed Kids, kind of chase, running around the woods. Something wrong with that. I'm just saying, there's something wrong with running around in the woods at night looking for black eyed kids. It's just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to see the black eyes, are you, if it's dark? Yeah, again, it's logic like somewhere. Nothing thought about, really. You know, it, no, no, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know it's, again, it's, it's, it's bringing. It's bringing them to the forefront, I suppose, isn't it? So you know, good well, on. Every, ta- every time you see Mr. every time you see Mr. Brickley, he's hugging the front of his book. He's, he's on the news and he's got his book on his arm. And it's got a picture of a pig's head on the front of it, which is cool. Don't get me wrong. I totally understand that he's he's got a, a standpoint and there's a reason for him to do what he's doing with his book. But you know, black eyed kids. It's the first time I've heard of encounters. It's been from where he is. I'm I'm struggling to keep going. Tabs on it. Dude, going back to the 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 samurai boots. Yes. Um, my, my own private chat room, my house. Um, the machine <laughs> she zoomed in on the um. On the pitch, and she thinks it might be part of the rock. I, I thought that, but it looked leather. Hold up, hold shirt. up again, yeah. Hold up, real yeah. quick. What? Come on, Mal. Um, no, no, I didn't say hold up. Also, I'm for a new, um, for a new tech person as well. Haters, <laughs> hate haters, hate all right. Do you know what? <laughs> Uh, I call it tangents, Morris. Tangents. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna see if there's any big Tesco sand. Bye. See you later. I'm gone. Oh, <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> Onwards and upwards, nevertheless. Adam, would you like to interview, uh, introduce the guest for us then? Yeah. Uh, we've been been speaking back and to over the last couple of weeks, and I'm absolutely delighted to be bringing on to on to our podcast, Dr. Kieran O'Keefe, top psychologist. Good bloke. Dr. O'Keefe, how are you? Good bloke. <laughs> not as, you've not, you've not, oh, well, you're still good. No, not. Good evening, guys. How are you doing? Good not evening. Too bad, thank you. And you? All right. Yeah, not so bad. Good, good. So what, what's new with you? Uh, not much. Just preparing for tomorrow morning where I'm teaching five hours of forensic psychology. Nothing to do with oh, nice. yeah, Just what we want to do too, man. Just what we want to do too. <laughs> <laughs> forensic psychology. Yeah, it's my other it, hat. Is the, w- would you go? Would you go as far as saying that's a, a huge pastime, or is it just something that it's you, you've grown interest in recently? Uh, no, I've been I been doing parapsychology and forensic stuff since well since 96 I guess parapsychology for five six years more than that but forensic psychology and that sort of stuff since 1996 okay how'd you get time how'd you get time to sleep I just <laughs> just well sleep, it. sleep that's for pussies <laughs> Overrated, <laughs> right, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. Overrated. <laughs> just, just while we're totally aware and on the same subject, are you are you tr- by saying sleep is for pussies? Are you trying out for the new Expendables movie by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> Come in, hanging off the wing of a plane with a machine gun. Go for it. It works. It works. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, I'm I'm over the moon that you've came on. I really am. And Adam's been yeah. itching all day with a piece of paper. Full of all notes and questions. Brilliant. So. <laughs> the sad thing is, I can't even read it. <laughs> my my handwriting is like childish hieroglyphs. Honest to God. Dear diary, 
I, 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 I do. <laughs> oh god! Wait, Aaron. I, I, I have got one question straight off the off the back for you, Doctor O'Keefe. Um, did you enjoy your breakfast on Saturday morning with the monks? <laughs> I don't even know. I do not even know. I don't to know either. I have no idea. I'm going to this, by the way. I did a, I, I'm going to have to explain this. I did a ghost hunt Friday night in Hereford. Yeah. Uh, Shire Hall, a, was it? With a group, yeah, Shire Hall, uh, with spectacular events. And they booked a room for me, uh, a budget room, um, at what they thought would be a hotel. It was a lodge. I'm not fussy about where I stay as long as I've got a place to uh, put my head and sleep. I turned up at this place just on the outskirts of Hereford, uh, walked into the reception and was immediately surrounded by seven or eight Benedictine monks in full kind of black oh. garb. <laughs> walked in and went, am I in the right place? And they said, well, presumably you're here for the retreat. And I went, no. And they're like, okay, well, Somebody will come out and help you. And this guy came out of nowhere, stood behind the reception. And he said, Dr. O'Keefe, you're the only one staying here that's not part of the retreat. <laughs> Belmont, <laughs> Belmont Abbey and the monastery. Oh, great. What on earth am I doing here? But <laughs> um, it was, uh, I got in about four o'clock in the morning. And I mentioned to them that... Uh, they said breakfast was between 8 and 9.30. I said, I'm going to be gone by 7.30. They said, okay, no problem. I came down at 7.30. Uh, there was a chef, well, it was a monk with a, with a, an apron <laughs> on, sat there at 7.30, and he said, you're Dr. O'Keefe? And I said, yeah. And he said, right. He said, I'm here to give you breakfast half an hour before everybody else. What would you like? And Whoa. served me the best full English I've ever had. That's yeah. immense. Nice. See, that's what, that's what celebrity status get you. Monks who cook your breakfast on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, they had no idea who I was. So it's about, about somebody who wasn't a monk, I think. Oh, God. But would, 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 you, would you say that could be another hat you may wear? Yeah. <laughs> what, being a monk? Yeah, yeah, why not? I think I've done too many things to uh, mean that I can never be a monk. Yeah, I think we all sit sadly on that same side of the fence in the paranormal. We're not loved by many. <laughs> not at all. Not at have, all. You, have you thought on whether, how they would have took it if they'd have found out what you were into, the parapsychology and the paranormal? Yeah, I don't think I would have been staying there that night. Do you know what? I don't think you'd have had breakfast either. No, God, no. My granddad's old school Catholic from Ireland. He's like, put it this way, and I, I know you're Catholic as far as I remember. You're Catholic yourself. And yeah, Irish. I, 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 yeah, exactly. You're probably from the same, cut from the same cloth as me. Where if anything they don't understand, it's bad. It's yeah. evil. You know, if there's a noise, and you don't know what it is. It's evil. Leave it alone. Absolutely. I can imagine my granddad if he was alive now to be throwing slippers at me for the things we do. The places we investigate. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the especially the Catholic faith. More than yeah. any other faiths, you know, and you think about some of the other faiths, they've all got elements of them that can support them. Yes. Yeah. Within the Catholic faith, no, absolutely not. And yet you get stuff like stigmata, possessions, you know, you get, and it, you read the Bible, and there's lots of paranormal activity reported in that, so why not? Yeah. Uh, 100%. I mean, I can see exactly where you're going with that. It's not, we're such, as a, as a religion, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a one-sided religion. We believe all the supernatural that was given to us in the Bible, but unfortunately, if we try and prove anything else, it's not, it's a false, mm. it's, it's false what we bring forward. Nevertheless, just to, another one for you as well, um, the, our gentleman who's, who's monitoring in the chat room, Stevens, just put Mo, can you mention to Dr. O'Keefe when he comes on that the School of Parapsychology is here in support in the chat room? Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, I just did a live lecture um, earlier on this evening with the uh, Foundations class for the School of Power Psychology. Various people, Chris, Dorothy, Donna, Angelina and Shez are there. So. Chris Beach. Hi guys. Chris Beach, yeah. yeah. Chris Beach is in the chat room. The first thing he said when he came into the chat room is, um, let me just bring it up. He appeared, I said hello, he went hello, hi there. And I went, and that was it, he went, waiting for, waiting for Kieran O'Keefe and I was like, 
Keanu no keeps got a gang. That's what it is now. He's got a gang. <laughs> it, was, it was just like, what are you for Keanu? <laughs> you wouldn't know whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, would you, really? When we keep no Keith, it's like, it could Ooh. be kind of creepy, <laughs> man. Do I owe this gentleman money, maybe? But nevertheless, Aaron, would you like to take over again? Yeah, I mean, you've 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 got something in. in Common, I suppose, with the, the three of us here. Um, you studied and you've taught in Liverpool, uh, yeah. and also studied at uh, Washington College in Maryland, which That's is where right. our, our American friend is from. Um, he works for the Historical Society there, and you know he, he does well out of it. You know, so I mean, you you made you majored in um, music and psychology, is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, have you? This is gonna. It might sound a bit daft, but does the have you ever used the music to do with parapsychology? Do you think it may, yeah, it may well, bring yeah. about a result? Yes. Or? Yeah, not not in terms of investigating, in terms of actually using music in that respect, but in terms of music knowledge, I've used in terms of investigating um, the possibility of infrasound. Yeah, as an explanation for haunting experiences, infrasound, low kind of frequency sound, yeah. um, and kind of the investigative mm -hmm. side of that was looking at uh, the work of Vic Tandy, who was a physicist, uh, an engineer, sorry, at Coventry University, who had an experience in a laboratory one night, seeing a shadow kind of walk past him, and he attributed it to um, an oscillating fan in an air conditioning unit. That was that was kind of oscillating at infrasonic level. Yes. So then he started on for this theory, saying that um, infrasound at kind of 17 hertz, we can't really hear it, but we can feel it. That might be causing haunting experiences. And so did a set up a concert, the Royal Festival Hall, in which we blasted infrasound at the audience while they were listening to um, uh, the piano being played on the stage by a famous pianist, and. Uh, Highly, well, it was ethical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which part was first? Was it the pianist that was ethical, or the fire at seventeen? <laughs> well, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, people had to report how their emotions changed over the course of the concert, but also report kind of anecdotally any strange feelings they had. And one, one of the best people reported stuff like, oh, I feel like somebody behind me is looking at the back of my head. I feel kind of spooked. I feel like the hairs are going up on my neck. Things that you'd associate with hauntings, even though they're in a concert. But my favorite quote was actually one of the, uh, um, one of the uh, people in the audience saying, "I'm not sure if the if it's the infrasound being blasted at me, but I feel like I've got the horn for the pianist." That <laughs> <laughs> was the best quote ever. Oh my god! But anyway, it was investigating infrasound. That's kind of the link with music, and then it was off the back of that that uh, Steve Parsons, who's a fantastic researcher and investigator, got in touch. I mean, we knew each other before then, but he was specifically interested in looking at that link between infrasound and haunting experiences and uh, um, in my opinion he did an incredibly good job of debunking that and basically saying that infrasound can increase the intensity of an experience rather than actually cause it. Yeah, so, it, so it, it, it could promote or go the other way with any sort of results really I suppose in that respect then, yeah? Have yeah, that well, right? well well, it, yeah, it's it's more so saying that if you have an experience in a haunted location, um, say you've got a sense of presence, if there's in, naturally occurring infrasound, if there's infrasound in that location, then your sense of presence that you get, the intensity, the strength of that experience will be inc increased, exaggerated because of the infrasound. So right. That's essentially what it's saying. Yeah. Well, that, that's quite interesting because there's, a, the, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't have, known that because I'm not I'm not clued in on anything to do with that type of thing because it's I'm I'm useless with all that. It's I'll, I'll be honest, it's just not something that I'd think of at all. But um, go going back to um your studies, um you'd done an honors thesis with the Institute of Parapsychology, which is That's right. the Ryan Research Centre now. Yes. Um, how did that come about? Um that came about um, 
kind of whilst I was doing, well, even before doing my degree, actually, I was in touch with the Institute of Parapsychology, kind of on the phone with them and kind of exploring the possibilities of visiting there really very early on when I was interested in parapsychology. But then when I was doing my degree, because I was in the States, I went down to the Institute to visit and met a parapsychologist, a lady called uh, Dr. Katamani and also John Palmer, Dr. Broughton, a number of key parapsychologists. And then when it got towards the end of my degree, when I had to do a psychology thesis, um, I said to the staff at Washington College in Maryland, I said, I'd like to do it on parapsychology. And they said, well, we're happy for you to do that, but none of us can supervise it. If you can find a supervisor somewhere else, then we're happy for you to do that thesis. And so I asked at the Institute of Parapsychology and ultimately they supervised my thesis. So uh, and supervised by Dr. Richard Wiseman, is that right? Uh, no, my, my thesis at the Institute of Parapsychology was an undergraduate one that was supervised by the Institute of Parapsychology. My PhD, my doctorate, that was supervised by Richard Wiseman. So, right. Uh, I did that after having done a master's. That was done at Hertfordshire. So yeah, yeah. You know, at a man of in, in his early forties, you know, you you've done an awful lot uh, of studying. You know, it's uh, hello. Let's say mid mid early thirties, please. Yeah. I would have said twenty one plus. I'd have said twenty one plus V A T, but you know, plus V A T. I I look rough for thirty two. You know what I mean? It, Kate looks. Kate looks good for fifty. Yeah, you thanks. Know, we, man, we, thanks. We've all got our age, you know. So we, <laughs> we do all have our ages, yeah. But I just like that you said early forties. That's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, I'll we, get him after the show. Don't worry. We, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I say, I mean, you've you've done an awful lot of studying, and you know, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of time to devote to to something that is sometimes viewed in a negative way, isn't it? You know. To to make psychology is you know it that it's a good profession on its own, but to to mix the paranormal in with it, I mean how how does that how does that come around? I mean once you once you've done all your studies and things like that, did you find it difficult trying to find work in that? Absolutely. Because I know yeah. from previous experience with myself, I mean you know I, I drive wagons for a living. And I couldn't get any work without the experience. Was that something that you faced when when you were ready to go? Yeah, but that's 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 the reason why very early on so I've been interested in parapsychology, well, paranormal for 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 years. My first ever ghost hunt was when I was a young lad. Um but hearing the name parapsychology, the title or the word parapsychology in the movie Ghostbusters, that's really what what got me started, to be honest, <laughs> even to the point where I called Columbia University and asked them about their parapsychology program, only to be shouted at down the phone and told, <laughs> no, we're not, we're not, we don't do that, it's just a film, just a movie. But they put me in touch with the Institute of Parapsychology uh, down in North Carolina, and very quickly I was told, look, if you want a career in this, great, but what you need to do is study other areas, because there are so few jobs in this particular field. And because there are so few jobs and so many people wanting them, the competition is going to be high. So, become an expert in some other area, and under you know, and get your foundation in some other training, so that at least you've got something to fall back on. Yes. So even though I've been studying parapsychology now um, for you know over 20 years, I have also been studying psychology and forensic and investigative psychology, so that I'm employed now at university to research parapsychology and to lecture on it, but at the same time, I'm also employed to lecture forensic and investigative psychology and in, part, and in charge of those degrees, because otherwise, yeah, I'd, I'd be stuck, to be honest, you know, to try and get a job where you're just doing parapsychology, is it incredibly difficult. Really? Yeah. I could it's imagine. Huge... I mean, sorry, Mike. Go on. Well, I was about to say it's a huge struggle with the paranormal, with anything to do with the paranormal, whether it be parapsychology, whether it just be uh, a gang of kids who want to go out and check out an old graveyard. The, the sad part is, no matter what you do with regards to the paranormal, it will be forgotten tomorrow. People it's, with that type of planet, with that type of society, where you're never going to get famous doing it, or if you do, it's going to be really rare, and look, you were lucky um, that you've learned so much that you, you've got yourself to a point now where people recognise you, people know your name, 
when we've talked about it. I mean, Aaron's sister bumped into me on the way down to school a couple of days ago and got all excited and started doing that with her hands when we found out we were interviewing you. All flappy thing. Yeah, she did. She did. <laughs> she went from being 27 years of age to 12 and thinking it was Justin Bieber. I'm like, okay. But, I mean, you've, you've done well to get where you are. I mean, I'm, please don't take that as a criticism. Take it as a massive compliment. You've done really well to be where you are now where people will look at you as a heavy authoritative figure in what you talk, especially with regards to the paras- parapsychology side. Yeah, but, Sorry, I was going to say yeah, but the interesting thing is, um, uh, why is that? And and the only I think the the only reason is because of the TV. Mm. I was a, I was a parapsychologist before Most Haunted. Yeah. No, I mean, that's the interesting thing. I was in, I was involved. Um, I was at Liverpool Hope University. Yes, you were. At Liverpool, you know, I was in Hertfordshire before that. Um, and then at various places, Paris and then Toulouse. Well, I was doing parapsychology, yeah. but it was it's most haunted, most haunted that's made me, you know, people know me because yeah. of that, and they know kind of parapsychology stuff because of that. But ultimately, it's it's kind of it's you know you're saying in terms of a legacy and people knowing knowing what you do and knowing yeah. sort of stuff. I guess I've got a reputation for being. Uh, you know, a skeptic, which ultimately means I'm open-minded, but I'm always questioning stuff, always looking for alternative explanations. But I wonder how many people have read the parapsychology research that I've done. They've read the papers that I've done. I, I don't think they have. Whereas you take somebody like Harry Price, okay. for example. Uh, you know, Harry Price is a key researcher who, for for decades was doing amazing research investigating various locations investigating the paranormal and he has a legacy of books and investigations that in the field I think people should be aware of him if they're not but he's he's become famous because of things like Borley Rectory people know Borley Rectory is the most haunted house in England and he's got a bit of a legacy so I think you're right in some respect that that we or generally people forget about research in paranormal. But I think there are a couple of key figures that we'll still refer back to, you know, even in a hundred years, or I hope we will, Harry Price being one, um, Houdini potentially being Epic. another one. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Epic. that. Uh, Epic. Between him and him and him, or what's his name, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the exactly. fights they used to have in, in general with regards to the spiritualism <laughs> of the paranormal, I can see what you mean. <laughs> Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying to do with you uh, saying about most of to putting you in the forefront for, for different roles and things like that. But do you not think that maybe if you look at it in, on a different slant, that it's an ideal shop window for you? So do, to, not just for like other TV work or you know documentaries to do with whichever. I'm, I'm talking more about you as a person, about Kieran O'Keefe as the person. The way you've put yourself over on TV, with the likes of Most Haunted and things like that, and the way you're speaking to us now, you come across as a really relaxed kind of guy, you know, approachable, not full of himself, and clearly you do know what you're talking about. So people who are watching those programmes and who may be looking for somebody to, to take on in the parapsychology field, they're looking at that and going, oh, okay, well, this, this fella knows what he's talking about. He seems approachable. It, it, it's a job interview that you don't have to attend, really. Yeah, that's true. You know, and <laughs> that's true. When you feel like that, and, uh, yeah, you put, yeah. I mean, thank, thank you very much. What you're saying is amazingly complimentary. Um, it's it's br- brilliant what you say. It's it's great, but and it's nice to know that it, that that. The genuine that I'm genuinely coming across that way, and that I'm coming across as a as a genuine person, and I guess maybe part of that comes from just having a passion for the field and just you know being really yeah. genuinely interested in it. I'm not, like I said, I was a parapsychologist and a psychologist before Most Haunted. That's the reason why I was asked to be on it. Yeah. So I was doing it before, and genuinely interested in haunting experiences and investigating this stuff anyway. And so, yeah, I'm just glad. I'm overjoyed that that co- that came across on the screen. You yeah, know, my motive, my motivation. I mean, I guess, I guess, 
yeah, t the TV experience was amazing. It was absolutely brilliant, and you know, I've I've had such amazing benefits from being on it. But at the same time, when when I got involved in it, it was very much me going. <clears throat> I'm doing this as a parapsychologist. I'm not doing it as a TV presenter or somebody that wants a TV contract. Keen, you were there for expert so, opinion, and I think that's what you've you've put across. You know, again, when I going back to how you put yourself across, when I first contacted you to ask you to come on, you know, I I wasn't expecting any form of answer. You know, and that that's 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 not a slight against you. That's just you know, okay, this could this could be this could be him. Yeah, okay, we'll bum 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 bum, and I get a reply. And there was Did no. Did you really send them? Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> yeah, I'll pull the screenshot. That was that that's was all I wanted. When I when I saw bum 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 bum, I thought that's it. I'm in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't believe it. I want to study this guy. Importance. There was no self-importance in any of the messages that that you've replied to me with and things like that. So it's it's not me trying to butter you up or anything like that. That's just my personal opinion. I mean, people there could be people watching going. <laughs> You clearly, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. But that that's my personal opinion of what how you put yourself across to me. Yeah. Well, it's also because it's also because if you if you if you're going to ask me, you know, and you're a you're a you know a radio pro or pod, podcast, and you're a group that's interested in this sort of stuff, you know, I'll chat to you about it. Simple as that. Just because it's a it's an in, an, an interest of mine. Yeah, I mean, we've, I've got to be honest. I, I'm Morris, our tech lad, literally a couple of minutes before you come on, he was absolutely flapping because he was got. I don't. Where, where's, where's the guest? Where's the guest? Where's the guest? Where's the guest? <laughs> <laughs> he said he's come on. You know, I was sitting there going, he's probably busy doing whatever, to and he's like, "Oh God, he's not going to turn up. Are you sure you've got the right fella?" It's like. I'm pretty sure, yeah, you know. I just had visions of this guy called Keen O'Keefe living in living in Brighton somewhere, going out. Oh, we've got these wound up. We've got them. <laughs> standing there, yeah. just in case. <laughs> oh, no. right, um, could, can I ask you a question with regards to um, when you were on Most Haunted? It's not a question. It, it all all I want to know is: Do you think where the show was concerned was was it? A, would you class it a highlight or a learning curve? For being with yes. this most haunted um, yes. franchise, to both of that, yes, yes, to both. As, as in, as in, I've got many highlights in terms of my parapsychology career. Highlights in terms of places that I've investigated outside of most haunted. Yeah, people that I've met as part of my journey. Um, books that I've read, you know, that I've discovered that I've never heard of before. I've got loads of highlights. And most haunted, it is one of those highlights. Yeah. Like I said, it's a highlight because it's afforded me the opportunity to meet people, to meet, to visit locations I would never get to. I was going to say that. Travel the world and see locations that, as a lowly parapsychologist, would be almost impossible to yeah. get access to. So that's been amazing. And the fact that I'm in a situation now where, you know, I am talking to people, I am known. You know, I'm chatting to people, you know, like yourselves, which I don't know if that would have ever happened. I would have still been an academic. Yeah. I would have still been in university, and people wouldn't have known about me and, and my area of interest. So it's a highlight in that respect in terms of, you know, I feel very lucky that I was part of it. <laughs> um, but also it was a learning curve. It was a learning curve in terms of being part of a television program, you know, and being... Yeah part of a situation where uh, the motivation is to make a television program. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it's still an investigation as in a group of people in a, lo in a location, but ultimately it was a steep learning curve to recognize, look, you know, the director and the producer, they have to, out of over a hundred hours of footage, uh, cut it down to 48 minutes. See, yeah. and he moans about three that hours. <laughs> That's me. That's me moaning about not having enough footage. <laughs> so, do we get your, your, your first appearance on Most Haunted? I mean, yeah. what, what, how did you feel to do with that? Was it kind of like a bit, a bit of cliche, maybe, uh, like a rabbit in the headlights? Was, you know, was it something that you were looking forward to as well as fearing at the same time? I think it was quite interesting. I think my first appearance. As actually part of the team, yes, 
rabbit in headlights, especially the first live show I did at Derby. They really didn't know what what to expect. My first actual appearance on Most Haunted, I was part of the studio. So I was commenting on footage that I was shown that I hadn't been part of the investigation. So I was in a kind of an editing room, sitting and watching the phenomena that they chose, and then I would actually just comment on it. And that was fine, because then that was it's very similar to what I'd be asked any given week in a parapsychology classroom. That wasn't a problem. The first ever one that I was on was actually Black Swan in Devizes in Wiltshire, where yeah. I wasn't part of the team. I hadn't officially joined the Most Haunted team, but Yvette and Carl said, would you like to join us on the Black Swan Devizes shoot? We've got a guest, Yuri Geller. Nice. And to be honest, that was that was the main motivation. I was about to say to, to meet to meet <laughs> Yuri Geller. I was just I was just thinking, well, this is this is a key figure in the history of parapsychology. I want to meet this guy, and I turned up, and he'd been there about 15, 20 minutes, and somebody went up to him and said, you know, can you bend a spoon for me? And he said, look, I I don't want to <laughs> Yuri bend Gelder. a spoon. You know, I don't want to I don't want to do I'm here to investigate this haunted location with the most haunted team. I want to look for ghosts. I want to be part of this. I don't want to be known as the guy who just bends spoons. And yeah. I, was, I was standing there thinking, well, it's a bit fucking late now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, over the course of, what, three or four hours that he was there, he did bend quite a few spoons, I should know. Yeah. I've got one that he signed for me as well. But Oh, you big kid. <laughs> Big kid. I think I might have sold it on eBay actually. But anyway, <laughs> that works. It was a classic. It was a classic, um, classic highlight because of meeting Yuri Geller. But it was my first experience being part of the team, an investigation. And I think because I wasn't officially part of the team, I didn't feel like a rabbit in headlights. Mm. I just thought I'm meeting Yuri. I'm meeting all of these people, part of the team. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't until really when we got to the live show, first live show, and I'd only done about three investigations then as part of the team, that uh, um, I thought, you know what? Yes, this is really daunting. When you walk up on stage and there's 500 people sitting in the audience and there are spotlights on you, you just go, yeah, this is not me sitting in my office or sitting in front of a classroom of 20 students. This is big. Um, and so it was. It was very, very daunting. Well, very daunting. Am I okay to ask you about one of the one of the live shows you've done? You've done. A, I don't know if you were involved in the show. I've, I've tried to find out and I couldn't. It was the village, the village of the damned. The um, one in Wales. Yes. Were you invo involved in that one, which is the big, big old asylum in Denbyshire? Oh, in Denby, yes, the Denby Asylum. Yeah. Yes, I was. Did you? You were involved in that. As yes, as a location, I mean, I've seen this externally a few times in the past, and it's a big, creepy build fact. And to be fair, from what I've seen as of late, it's felt a huge disrepair, massive disrepair. Has it really? It is. In there is rumour though that it's meant to be getting renovated and turned into luxury apartments. Oh, cool, cool. But yeah, it's. Was it when you were there? Was it? Sounds horrible to say. Was it treated well? Were what were your thoughts on that as a place? I mean, I've looked through. I've I've watched pretty much all the most haunted shows when they were out, and of all the places, a lot of the places you look at, you think, I can see why the why why it was investigated. It looks creepy. It has a history, and in that place, I uh, pardon my French to this. That it, it looks like shit went down there when you look at it, and you you see how it literally looked. What's the word? It looked a bit too. Good to be true as a location, a bit too uh, stand out as far scarier looking, far darker past to most of the other places that were looked at. Do you remember much of that investigation? I do remember, yeah, I do remember a lot, and it's quite interesting what you say because I remember speaking to um, the design guys uh, on the first day when I turned up and yeah. chatting to them about the studio. That they set up with all the, you know, where, where the audience sat and yes. where the presenter sat, and they were showing me photos of what it had looked like before they went in, and then yeah. it was a complete disarray. It'd been 
vandalized, left to just become completely derelict. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there was a real sense, I guess, a real sense then of um, this is somewhere where you know it's just a, a loss of respect for the building. You know, it's just completely gone to yeah. pot. Completely gone to pot. Um, beyond that, I know. Um, in terms of actually being in a location like that, there's all there's a huge kind of debate or controversy, I think, about investigating anywhere that has a history of mental health. It, it's, a history see, of mental I, I health think it's care, a bit of honest, there's an ethical kind of an ethical debate that we could have about whether you should even be doing that. Mm. To be honest, because ultimately you're trying to contact spirits associated with a location, but it's a location where there was care of mental health patients. Yeah. So I think there's a real ethical dilemma the, there. The one problem that I, I, the one thing I always come up against, I've watched a lot of documentaries where mental health's concerned in the past. And when you look at places like Hyroids, um, which is a little further down south, a lot of people, mental health, uh, say 80 years ago, 70 years ago, was treated far different to what it is now. If you felt down in the dumps, and you felt like, for instance, imagine we've all had it. You wake up and you think, oh, I can't be bothered going to work. I just feel really peed off with the day. You could be put away for that. And oh, it yeah. has happened in the past. So a lot of... Put away for stealing a loaf of bread. Yeah. I know up in Liverpool, one of the we had an asylum just outside of Liverpool. And um, at Rainhill, a woman was put in there for the theft of bread because they thought she was not sane in mind. They just locked it away, and she done years because of it. But I mean, when you look at most places, you could investigate. Um, what one is it? Oh God! A pretty, well, I'm trying to pick a specific one, but pretty much everywhere you investigate, there's always been some form of tragedy or trauma. People, like for instance, in Liverpool at the moment, we've got an, an old um, orphanage called Newsham, Newsham Park Hospital. Used to be an orphanage, and children have died there. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, all of the a lot of the um, ghost event groups or the the event groups have got older and started to call it asylum because for a short period of time it held overflow from a local asylum, mm. and it went on from there. So there was children who passed away there, and people investigate there for the for the same purpose. Now I totally agree what you're saying. There's there's controversy behind the the mental health side, but the Sadly, there's controversy and pretty much everywhere we go when yes. you investigate, you, you yeah. sort of run a really bad title. Absolutely. Sorry. But yeah, I think you're right, you know, when you're looking at some of these historical places in terms of the treatment and how much more advanced we are in terms of care and recognising that, you know, a mental health issue is, is not just um, violent psychosis. It could be lots of different forms, um, oh, but also I mean, the treatment, the treatment of it being in the past, you know, horrific uh, interventions like lobotomies and electroshock therapy and that sort of stuff. And electroshock therapy, even that, you're only talking about that stopping maybe 20, 30 years ago. It's not a yeah. long time ago yeah, yeah. Well, that that actually stopped as a possible intervention. You know, so those sorts of ideas would, would be very much at the forefront of people's heads as they're going in and investigating and thinking yeah. about those sorts of things. And I think televisually is one thing but also as investigators there's always this sense that you've got to try and find somewhere that's so dark and and has yeah. a sense of being evil and so if you find a location where it has a, a history of poor treatment of mental health the implication is that the people that would have been doing the caring would have been nasty would have been evil it would yeah. have been bad and i think investigators naturally like like to do that but like i said it's 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 debatable because you do get some locations where they're described as asylums, they're given that immediately negative association, and the care mm. may have been, may have been all right. It, you know, it's just there's that stereotype. Well, I think that I think with with some places where they are describing it as an asylum, I think that's strictly from a sales point of view. Yeah, mm. uh, you Solid. know, obviously, if you want to say, oh yeah, come and have a look at this old fishing hut. You're not going to get one coming in. Because if you say, oh, yeah, it used to be an asylum first, though. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll have yeah. a look, yeah? You know. Yeah. I mean, have a look at what you think. Let's go stand for trout. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you there, to be fair, there's a few down by the park and all that. But, um, oh, God. You know, I mean, to do with what you were saying, to do with um, mental illness and things like that, I mean, I've, I've, I've got no problem with saying, I mean, like, a lot of people... Um, 
class ADHD as a mental illness, whereas it isn't. Now, I have ADHD. And, you know, if I think years ago, if, if I'd have had one of them days where I, I can see noise, <laughs> you know, it, it oh God, yeah. I, I don't even want to know what he did to him. <laughs> As I've been yeah. looped up to everything, the, 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 the electric things, with, you know, the electric shock treatments, maybe Absolutely. even yeah. with your car batteries just for good measure, you know, but, <laughs> you know, they, and the the one thing that I, I do think that he could have done was like something like a Hannibal Lecter type of thing, maybe without the mask, but, you know, say, you know, <laughs> sod this, he's a bit of an idiot, stick him on a board, strap him up, he ain't moving, well, you know, so, so thing... you know, they could have just left him in a room just to a lot of people around, were. you know, but it's... It, it is yeah, the advances it's, it's that we've got now. Down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Even, you know, you mentioned examples of stealing stuff, but also, especially uh, Ireland was notorious for this in terms of yeah. uh, women who were going through the menopause. Yeah. And, and, you know, that they could be just, just locked up because of that and people not really understanding what they're going through. Or, you know, so, yeah, it's horrific treatment in the past. And I think we've made such amazing advances in terms of awareness and understanding and, and true care, you know. And also, like you say, you know, um, well, you didn't use the word, but stigma. Yeah. You know, there's still yeah. a stigma, but it's so much better than it was. And the, the stigma in the past has always been lumping all mental health problems into one. Whereas, you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of, uh, of not labelling everything as a mental health problem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, uh, and, I mean and also, from... if you say ADHD, suddenly people have this stereotype of what you know somebody with ADHD says, and yet we yeah. know there are so many different aspects yeah. to it. There are so many different types. There are so there are people who maybe the the, the 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 main part of it is hyperactivity rather than the attention deficit. Exactly. There are varieties. Now, see, now I, I disagree to a point where with. Um, they, they caught with them calling it attention deficit hyperactivity disorder because I mean I'll, I'll be honest with you yet yeah, maybe some days I can struggle to, to stay focused on somebody having a having a conversation I mean if if I'm on the bus and somebody's speaking to me or whatever you know and they say are you listening to me yeah but I'm also listening to the three people at the back talking about the football the guy over there talking about his, his wife having a foot operation and someone chewing bread for gummy ducks it, you know it's you know, oh. it, it's far from an attention <laughs> disorder. You know, it just yeah. okay. My, my attention may not solely be on you, but that doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to somebody. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's it, it's one of them. It's I mean, I, it doesn't bother it's a me. Label, isn't it? And it's, well, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, if you go back to the eighties, you know, there was no. It was very, very, very unheard of in the eighties. You, it was. I mean, a, a, a good friend of mine calls it a little bastard syndrome. So, <laughs> Um, it, honestly, it's it's it, no, 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 it's one of Keaton's football team. <laughs> the coach's football I only got, team. I only got diagnosed. No. That's a son's football team, by the way. My son's called <laughs> Keaton, also. Um, okay. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, where did I play football? <laughs> no, it's, you know, I only got my diagnosis in July of last year, so I've gone pretty much all my life you know, ambling through, if you like. So when, yeah. when I told this person, I said, you know, yeah, you know, ADHD now, yeah, it's all official, this, that, and the other, and she said, oh, I used to call that little bastard syndrome. So I said, well, I'm an adult, so I, I can't be a little bastard. She went, no, you're a big one. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm come day, go day with anything like that myself. You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not bothered. If people want to know something about me, ask. Right, Keaton, can I ask you? Was anything like that. Can I ask you a bit of a weird segue question? Um, sure. It's something which has bugged me in a very, for a very long time, and it's about demonology as a, an entire genre of paranormal is demonology. Where do you stand upon that? Oh, in terms of... Oh, brilliant question. In, um, it's, a, it's an awkward I, one, but it's a question no, nevertheless. it's not awkward. I'm probably the world's first sceptical demonologist. Good. <laughs> As in, That'll be God, the bizarre though it may seem, I'm yeah. actually nice. a qualified demonologist. And the reason why is because 
rewind about four or five years ago and I saw a rise in the number of demonologists in North America being mm. part of investigations yeah. and you know whereas investigators would talk about ghosts any hauntings or poltergeist type experiences a demonologist would immediately attribute it to a demon yes a demonic entity mm. my worry was that uh, the complete disregard for ethics and the impact of telling somebody in a private residence that it was a demonic spirit and you know that it was a, a demon and they would have to exercise it or kind of giving the whole negative side to it and not being aware of the impact on the person who, who's the focus of the haunting and then we started to see a few of them uh, occur in England so I thought right I know from my perspective as somebody who's brought up Irish Roman Catholic truly somebody who's a demonologist should be somebody with an encyclopedic knowledge of demons that's really what it is and somebody who's maybe worked with priests and kind of understood the Christian heritage of demon demons and that sort of thing what we were finding is that basically a demonologist is somebody that's bought a qualification off the internet because they've read a book and done one assignment me and me if they wear black <laughs> that's it that's what me and Kate me and Kate made that own made that own certificates on an old radio show in about four minutes and gave them all to all the guests because we wanted them all to be demonologists <laughs> When, when you not start your own religion at one point as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kira, go for it. The um, oh yeah. Uh, why I I signed up to um, a virtual university in the states, where some of these demonologists got their demonology qualification from, and I thought, you know what? At some point, I'm going to be asked to be give the skeptical side to demonology so I'm going to get the same qualification as them and I did and I got the qualification by you know buying the course and the course meant that I had to read one book and it was a book by the Warrens you might know <laughs> Ed and Lorraine Excuse Warren. me. and then yeah. I, was, I had to complete one test which was about 10 questions and then produce an essay about the book that's right. it and I got a qualification of demon. Was one of those was one of those questions, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> I was the I, you know what, right? I don't mean to sound horrible to the entire sure. paranormal community. Please don't take this as a criticism towards you for doing the the, 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 the demonology course and the test. But unfortunately I, when you look at some of the American T V shows and I mean I I don't I think you may have worked with them once before, Ryan Buell. He works. He's a um, yes, run. paranormal state. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't work with Brian Ryan, but I worked uh, with Chad Callick, who worked that was in the Chad. State yeah, Canada Chad. State a while, yeah. Yes. Now he, they, they believe every single noise and every moth fart in the distance is demon or demonic, and they need to get the house blessed by somebody or someone. Um, and it's the same with like shows like Ghost Adventures, for instance. They everything's demonic. Everything scratches them three times, and it's it's like they sort of created their own. F there's no better way of wording it. Their own fashion in the middle of the paranormal, where their type of evidence is different to the next person. So then they're getting demonologists on, and they're demonologists are getting on. There was one guy who walks in, big black suit on, guy in his late 60s. For the love of God, I wish I remembered his name. He was dressed like the guy out the exorcist, would, what you'd expect him to dress like if he wasn't in a priest's habit. He, he was like, how can I put it? Um, gangster meets demonologist put them together that was him meets, meets Marilyn Manson yeah yeah, DJ, yeah classic, <laughs> classic. and you think could you be more cliche to a demonologist walking in with your suit on and you know it sort of it was very he, he looked a bit too what's the, Hollywood yeah basically I'm, I'm glad you pointed that, that you came up with that but it's just I feel it's a fashion more than a, a genuine following or not a following uh, more than more than a genuine study it's more of a fashion and I do think it's going to phase away to something sooner sooner rather than later mm. and I just I kind of worry on what's going to come next yeah it's it's, it's, it's yeah. an expect the unexpected type of situation I think isn't it you know yeah, sadly, I sorry, think yeah. all of us here at some point have probably had an argument with somebody over something that you believe in you know it's yeah. I mean, some people do it just, I think, just so they've got something to belong to in that respect. You know, they, yes. they've got no, um, they've got no real direction, or they don't know which direction they want to go with their life, so they, they find something, they like the look of it, oh, okay, yeah, that, 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 that's my thing now, that, that's what oh. I'm going to do. 
mm. you know, it's, it's, it's up to anyone. I mean, it, it is what it is, I suppose. You know, it's um, it's one of them. But to do with um, to do with getting the qualification for the demonology, yeah. you know, is, is there anything that you've been asked to do with 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 those people? You know, have you had to speak speak with them, give them lectures and things like that, and uh, you know, if so, you know, did it go well? <laughs> uh, in terms of demonology, no. No, I've given a lecture once up in York. There was a conference uh, generally. I think it was more focused on um, kind of early Christian work and its association with the paranormal and that sort of thing. And I mm -hmm. put forward a suggestion for doing a demonology thing, and it was well, well received. And essentially, I was giving that sort of message of... of Exactly what I've just said here. That typically, traditionally, a demonologist is somebody who has encyclopedic knowledge of the history of demons and knows the ins and outs and knows can name every single demon. That's it. They're not involved in investigations. And the worry was, and what you're highlighting here is that actually what we're seeing is a demonologist is simply somebody who uh, dresses in black and says everything's evil, and, and yeah. that's it. And so it might, it might pretty much doom say that, I think experience at all anyway but but generally that's it and if you ask them you know to name you know the, the traditional 12 demons in early Christian or in kind of you know Roman times they would have no idea what you're talking about yeah know? so that's my concern and that's why I did it to kind of highlight how, how rubbish a lot of these qualifications are you know Right, Kieran, I've got two questions which have appeared in the chat room. One of the questions has appeared seven times. Wow. By the, yeah, by the same person. This right. person's um, slightly over overzealous and also one of our team members. You absolutely sod. Will you stop asking the same question? Um, the first <laughs> question is... I can't, I can't help it. Right, the first question I've got to ask you, which is from one of the other um, viewers in the chat room, is... Very cliche, simple question, but have you ever seen a ghost? No. No. I, you know, I, I've asked a lot of people the same question, and you get very 50-50s on that one. And the next question is, would you go as far as saying you were a sceptic swaying towards either side? or? Um, I would say I've always been sceptical, as in open-minded, rather than cynical. So I'm yeah. open-minded to the possibility, but I'm always questioning and people have asked me, especially within the last decade, with doing Most Haunted and with doing a lot more investigations than I've ever done, have I been swayed either way from scepticism to cynicism or scepticism to kind of believer and being yeah. dogmatic about it? I think the only... I haven't been swayed. The only thing I would say is that I'm still sceptical, but I'm actually more sympathetic to people that have experiences, yeah, right. whereas before I was sceptical and when I would think about people that are having haunting experiences, my automatic reaction would be, I'm going to try and explain this from a natural point of view, I'm going to try and find an alternative explanation, that's it. Whereas now I'm very conscious of the fact that when people ha genuinely have a haunting experience, or they feel that they genuinely had a haunting experience, I'm very conscious of how much that experience means to them. Yes. Rather than me barreling in as a, you know, as a scientist saying, well, I can explain that because, you know, you were waking up and it's a hypnopompic hallucination because it's the dream state between waking and sleeping. No, there has to be more sympathy to the impact of that experience in that person's life, in that person's belief structure, everything. Yes. You know, and it and it the way I approach things now is a lot more conversationally and try and get the person who's had the experience to think about alternative explanations rather than you give them those alternative explanations. So I think that's, that's the only change I've really had. That could be quite difficult for some people though as well, I suppose. I mean with, to do with what you were saying, to do with the the conscious subconscious dream state and things like that. And also simply through stubbornness. You know, if, if I think mm -hmm. people want to believe in that it's something that much, they're, they're not going yes. to be swayed, are they? You know, it, no, it's no, cool. they're not. They're not going to be swayed, and that's I think the key thing is that is that you find the sceptical community 
although I value skept the, the skeptical community and skeptics kind of offering this alternative explanation, there's a sense very much for some of them that it's a crusade to convince people of natural explanations, you know, especially when it comes yeah. to the paranormal. And they feel like they crusade, and it's their kind of duty as skeptics to to change people's minds. Whereas I'm of the opinion, no, just give people the information about these alternative explanations, and then if they choose to stick with the paranormal explanation, yeah, well, know, that's it, really. It's perfect because we, as as a investigating team, me, Adam, and our investigators on the other side of the the Atlantic, <laughs> when we get anything which we deem as being questionable, we'll put it to people and say, we're going to ask for your opinion. And we, we won't say, what's this in the bottom left-hand side that looks like a dog that's made out of smoke or something, whatever the hell it is. But back to, I mean, we've always run like that for that purpose, which, again, I, you know, I applaud you on the way that you, the way you think. It's really, it's, it, 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 it's refreshing to be able to speak to somebody who isn't a, a heavy skeptic or a heavy believer. Somebody will sit there and go, I'm cautious, and I'm not going to say one, I'm not going to say the other. But it was, it, there's also um, a few months ago when we were on radio, not using video cast, we... I got into a bit of a gripe with somebody, and the only thing I could come out with as a as a saying was, to a skeptic, no proof is ever enough, and to a believer, no proof is ever necessary. And you sort of sit in the middle, and it's like if I ever had to sit on a fence, you do it perfectly with the answer you gave. And you know what? I'm I'm glad I'm glad you put it down into a, a, a sympathetic skeptic. I like that that works yeah, for me. Yeah, and I think that's the best thing because my my I think cynics are as bad as dogmatists and that is yeah. at both ends of the spectrum you've got cynics and dogmatic believers yes. and they are so similar in that they are blinkered and won't listen to each other's arguments yeah. at all it's unhealthy. and I think that's incredibly unhealthy yeah. it really is See, I, I think um, <laughs> we're going to start winding down because we've okay. um, because we've, we've got about 20 minutes left before we, we go off basically Um Going back to the links that you have with Liverpool, um, you're obviously familiar with the Liverpool accent. Oh yeah. Uh, God. We we. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't you shake your head. <laughs> you know, we've, um, we've we've been trying to get some some of the scouts lingo. Um, okay. You know he's 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 had a good go. <laughs> he's had a good go. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see that. Um, you know, so we we want to get somebody else's opinion of it because he thinks we're, we're telling him lies, saying yeah, mate, go on, you, you you could live here and you'd, you'd fit in, no problem. He's he's not having it. No, he wouldn't. So we want to get it. No, you're right. Like oh, he wouldn't fit in. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> having a different opinion, a neutral's perspective, at, you know. So you're, in, you're up here, in mate. Terms of, in terms of scouts, in terms of having lived in Liverpool for a number of years. Um, we're sorry to hear about that, by the way. Could <laughs> <laughs> work better. Well, also the fact that I lived on the border of Toxteth as well. Oh crap! It was a fun time. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in the late eighties, was it? Early nineties. <laughs> no, thankfully. Go for that. But yeah, there are so many phrases that I heard in Liverpool where even myself, uh, as as an Englishman. I just didn't understand some of the time. You know, we, we do Absolutely. define like we, we do it completely restructure things. Yeah, it is really a language unto its own, and there are words that really you wouldn't hear anywhere else. And one of my favourites was uh, kex. 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 What a kex cares. Kex. What a kex cares. Ah, uh, okay. Kex. Don't, okay. Google it. Don't Google it. Hands in the air. I want to see your hands. Hands. Kex. Yeah. Um. Some sort of food or some sort yeah, of yeah, drink. You eat them. Yeah, you Close. eat them. I'm yes. being very vague, and the reason I'm being very vague is if I get <laughs> too much into it, Dr. O'Keefe has a two-year study to look at my yeah, head. I don't <laughs> want to eat my kicks. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. You know, he's no, one of those You're your balls. No, no, no balls. No, no balls. Close very close. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're Johnson. Trousers, yeah. No, your trousers. Oh, your trousers. Oh, your trousers. trousers. Oh, I'm a pervert. I'm sorry. You need to see your mind. <laughs> Kate broke the internet. Thanks, Kate. Right, just oh. another one. And, and just, I, I'm still getting handled in the, in the chat room. Before we go any further and pick on Kate slightly more, um, <laughs> three words for you. The Enfield Poltergeist. Oh, fab. 
Oh, I was waiting for you to get excited there. <laughs> yeah. oh, brilliant. The Enfield Bowls guys, lots of people ask me about favourite cases and have, have I ever come across uh, a case or investigated a case where I've been swayed either, you know, I've been swayed in terms of the evidence that's presented yeah. and the Enfield cult poltergeist is one of those particular cases that I wish I'd been involved in at the time but as a poltergeist case in terms of the evidence and the research that's involved, Maurice Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair it's just amazing. Um, I wrote a book uh, a few years ago and did a chapter in it about the Enfield Poltergeist. And I was lucky enough to give the chapter to Maurice Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair and get their comments on it. And Maurice spoke to me, I guess, about six months before he passed away to chat about the case. And I said to him, look, you know, here we are, um, you know, almost 30 years on from the case. You know, how do you feel about it? Is there anything else that... You know, you, you'd anything you'd like to say this number of decades on, and he just said, you know, given the weight of the evidence and the variety of the evidence and and what we had to deal with, he said, I'm I'm even at this stage, 30 years on, feel as though this was the best case that I was ever involved in, and I have no other explanation other than to say that we were dealing with a poltergeist. Absolutely phenomenal case, and we we've got a, there's a a dramatization of it appearing on Sky, I think. Yeah, yeah. next Sunday. Starring the ever amazing Timothy Spall. So I'm looking forward to that. It should be brilliant. But um, it is, if you don't know the case, if any of the, the listeners and watchers don't know the case, then please, please really look into the case. Um, this House is Haunted, I think, is one of the best books. Um, Guy Lyon Playfair. I think that's what it's called. A guy alone play for anyway. It was one of the investigators, and yeah. he wrote his account of uh, Enfield Poltergeist. Mm. Just the amount of footage there are. You will find when you read the case there are some instances where um, the children involved in the case did fake some of the phenomena and were caught faking some yeah. of the phenomena. But there's other instances yeah. where you've got independent witnesses who uh, reported stuff there that it's difficult to find an alternative explanation. I mean you have to deal with it as an anecdotal report. You know, we can't we can't assess it as more than that, but if you just deal with it in terms of the weight of the evidence, then you've got to be impressed by the case. Got yeah. to be I just wish it was happening now with all of the <laughs> technology that we had and all of the video yeah. cameras because we just didn't have enough of that. You know, there's only a few photographs that were by a Daily Mirror reporter and some audio recordings, and that's about all the evidence that we have. It, it's fr it is frustrating to look back on something like that, which was, to be fair, as as far as I remember from what what I researched into it, and I'm not going to lie, to you, it was only brief my research into it. There was never a a resolution onto why what happened happened, other than the fact that the girl who was heavily att not heavily attacked, but the girl who seemed to be the person who was centralised, and it was going through puberty at the time which has always been linked between poltergeist activity and pubescent girls, apparently yes. due to hormones or, I don't know, but yes. it's hard to explain. But yeah, that's there, is, that, there is that link, and there's a researcher called William Rowe, a uh, well-known parapsychologist, who said that a lot of poltergeist, poltergeist cases, or the majority, over 70%, or uh, around 70%, are focused around, like you say, pubescent girls kind of going into adolescence. Um, and he says that, and he says that it's not caused by spirit, it's caused by the girl, or he calls them agents, that it's them, it's a PK type thing. So he, he instead of saying poltergeist, he says RSPK, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. They're either yeah. consciously or unconsciously causing the phenomena. Now, I think it's an interesting theory, and a lot of parapsychologists mm -hmm. buy into this, and very early on in my parapsychology career, I always distinguish between hauntings and poltergeist because of the work of William Rowell and, and thought that they should be distinct from each other. Now I'm, I'm not. There's some great writings by Alan Gould, for example, who argues very strongly that we shouldn't distinguish between the two. But there's also a logical argument that means that we should treat what William Rowell says and this kind of stereotypical idea of of it being caused by girls going through puberty and, and you know into adolescence. The logical argument is, if that was the case, if that truly is the cause, then 
we should be having hundreds, if not thousands, of these cases. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Shut in my how, often, how often, as investigators, how often do we come across poltergeist cases? It just, yes. So in, in my career, I've been involved in less than five poltergeist cases. Wow. It's just so few and far between. In terms of genuine poltergeist cases, where the sense is that it's it's moving of objects, it's loud noises, not a haunting, it's poltergeist. It just it just happens so infrequently that I think the theory of it being as girls moves into adolescence, I think it's just it just doesn't. It seems maybe it could be the just the easy answer, maybe. Yeah. yeah. It, it's frustrating because if we could work out that I mean. You'll know yourself through doing psychology. Instead of looking at what has happened, you look at what has caused what happened to happen. It's it's mm. quite common across science. It's quite common across engineering. And if there's a failure or a fault in a piece of machinery, you look at what caused the failure, and then fix yes. the failure. It's the same as where, as weird as it sounds, where poltergeist activity or any activity concerns, it must stem from somewhere, as opposed to trying to say. That's happening. Wonder what it is. Try and work mm. out what the main proponent is. And if, if if somebody could just sit there, if we could just have that one person dedicated in life to get all of the accounts together and go right there's the common denominator that what caused it, yeah. then it may make life slightly easier. But that's obviously it's too, it's going to be a too good to be true situation. There's never going to be an answer to why it happens. It is, and it and it's about proving or disproving a theory. William Roll had his theory, but of course the cases he looked at and and the investigations he conducted meant that, that he was finding a greater percentage was centered around adolescent girls. But like I said, Alan Gould and his work, um, he looked at cases and he said, no, he said, you get a complete overlap. You don't really get a commonality. The only commonality would be poltergeist phenomena is generally, it's, you know, it's, it's noisy phenomena. You know, it's objects yeah. moving, crashing, and and he said, that's really the only common thing that we have. But in terms of trying to find a common cause, it's incredibly difficult to do that. And also, by their very nature, poltergeist cases are often very short-lived. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's compared to walking cases, which can go on for decades, hundreds of years. One, there's one there that that I um, it was again, it was made into a film. Um, what's the name of it? When when the lights go out. I think I've got that right. Um, yes. To do with 30 East Street in Yorkshire. Um, oh, that's right. Yes. You know that. I mean that that was another one. Um, I mean they, they actually advertised that place as a bed and breakfast now, where you don't actually get breakfast and you have to take your own bed. Um, <laughs> you know, so you know it's it's an interesting it's an interesting concept in itself that one, isn't it? But yeah, it, it's, it's, and I wonder how much of it is also promoted by the film. Poltergeist yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, I... Mm. Uh oh, he's fell slumped. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take a lot, mate. To be fair. <laughs> uh, right, we've we've got ten minutes left. Um, right, okay. Is there anything new that you wanna that you wanna let people know about, then, Kieran, or you know, if, is that um, what's, what's on the horizon for yourself? Yeah. Well. Um... Well, there's a few different things coming up, but um, I'm doing. I'm working with the UK Haunted guys. Oh, cool! Um, yeah. So I'm doing some stuff with them that people need to look out for, and they can. They, I've been what following them on Instagram, watching some of the things they get up to on Instagram. They look like funny guys. They just yeah, they are brilliant. Fun. No, you've hilarious guys. You've done well with them guys. So yeah, so I'm doing some work with them. Um, I'm running. Uh, You'll, well, you'll find this funny, an exorcism and possession course, part of the School of Parapsychology, and people very much quickly log on to that and uh, sign up to that thinking that they're going to learn how to exercise demons. <laughs> well, oh, if wow. you listen to anything I've said this evening, you'll realise that's certainly not the case. Yeah. No. Uh, Unless you wear black. <laughs> Unless you wear black, and a fedora. Black, then I'll you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, you, get some, you get some free holy water if you sign. <laughs> <so. laughs> yeah, I think we're gonna need it. <laughs> I mean, you can, if you can keep us posted with them um, with any any of the upcoming things that you're doing. You know, just yeah. a quick message to Absolutely. either me, myself or to our group inbox, whichever, and we'll yeah, promote it up for you in any way, shape, or form we can. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, um, no, I'll keep BTWN. 
on my Twitter uh, feed, so I'll, I'll start following you. And yeah, you may regret that, by the way. You'll possibly regret that. The random picture will be it's nothing to do with me. And then I'll have to do the politically incorrect thing of unfollowing. That would be <laughs> yeah. That's like social media suicide. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> there is one last thing that I, I want to ask you about. It's it's light hearted. It's completely <laughs> the face away John from Ukeira what we've been picture. talking about tonight. Um, I did see earlier on a video on YouTube. Oh yeah. Apparently, you're quite the impressionist. Yeah. Would you be willing to maybe <laughs> give us an honestly hard fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to know how this came about with the animal impression? I'd love to know. Yeah, He's got to explain. It was my. It was the. So when I said, "Yeah, I'll join the most haunted team," um, I, I think it was my first, my second shoot was at a Dutch castle, um, and they basically had me in my traditional kind of sceptical role, which was done the investigation and then at the end of the investigation kind of the next morning I was stood on a bridge outside this castle uh, and they said right if you can talk about the skeptical side of the phenomena that uh, you've, you've uh, experienced here so I talked about the skeptical side for about 10 minutes and they said okay great you know we'll cut, cut what we think is good and use that but is there anything else that you think is interesting worth pointing out and I was like well you know there's a train track over there so maybe if people have uh, heard any noises it could be because of the train track and so we always need to be care careful of extraneous noise when we're investigating and Carl said okay great um, is there anything else I was thinking in my head why does he keep asking this you know I've said everything I can think of so I said well maybe one thing we need to be careful of is the fact that uh, we're in Holland so if we are, you know, if we are going to hear any noises on EVPs or recordings, is it English or we, we should we listening out for Dutch words, that sort of thing? And he said, okay, great. Is there anything else? And I thought, oh God, stop! You know, why you keep asking it? I've said everything. So I just said in a complete dead hand, straight face, I said, actually, there is something else that I have noticed. And at that point, along the moat. A duck came underneath the bridge and I said there is something I have noticed since I've been here at this particular um, Dutch castle I have noticed that there is a distinct difference between um, the uh, the sound that a Dutch duck makes compared <laughs> to the sound that an English duck makes um, and allow me to illustrate um, uh, an English duck will make this particular sound quack quack <laughs> Whereas a Dutch duck will have a slightly more drawn out sound and perhaps almost uh, slightly seductive, and they'll go and and they'll do this. You <laughs> say, <laughs> make a seductive duck. For a minute there, I thought I was in Deutschland. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That's that, how that, it all started. That is and I said that. that the crew, the crew collapsed because I did it completely straight faced. And then from <laughs> that point on, any time I did an interview, so any time I did the sceptical interview afterwards, yeah. at that point, the last question from Carl was always, "Kieran, have you noticed anything interesting about?" And then wherever we were, he would instantly make up an animal. The Aylesbury Park, yeah, or anything, or whatever it was. The, the, the I can't remember. Bottle with the bottle with the beaver, bottle beaver, the beaver, the beaver with the teeth. <laughs> I was watching the video and before. I, I was and crying. I just had to make it up. I, every, every single one of those was completely made up on the spot without. That work. was that was absolutely brilliant. I'm sorry. Do you know what? Of all the things I've seen on TV full stop when you see somebody just go at it and just think do you know what screw this for the game of cards I'll do it my way that was not <laughs> the impressive thing is the commitment to it yeah it's like you, you know even, I mean, the, even the, the, the detail the that goes into <laughs> about the seductiveness of the Preston Pigeon and things oh, like that I'm Preston, going, pigeon. What? <laughs> yes, Preston Pigeon 
the worst one I got asked was to do the funky chicken that a job interview. A group, a <laughs> job interview and to do the funky chicken. Oh, that was impressive. The, the no, press it was <laughs> oh, God. But no, it is. It's. It's. And I think that that shows a completely different side to you again as a person. You know what I mean? For the education you've got, the career you've got, and things like that, you can also take yourself with a pinch of salt. And yeah, exactly. on, I, I don't mind having a laugh don't and things take, like that. Yeah, exactly. Don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah. Simple as that. No, I, I told I'm Morris sorry. I was going to pull you about those, and he went, "No, you can't do that." I said, "Why not?" And he's because he, he'll just hang up and call us all the names under the sun. I said, "Listen, yeah, if he was going to do you that, do you really think he'd have done it on camera? You know, and it was like, <laughs> you know, I, I thought I had a really valid argument, do you know did, and was? I agreed not to no. ask you about it, and then decided, no, sod, you're not going to ask you.' My favourite, my favourite, and this is the. Um, one of the funniest things about the animal thing is I remember doing a live show I can't remember where it was now, I think it was London, did a live show one of the fans came up to me and said have you actually seen a Preston Pigeon? Oh. and she was genuinely asking if I'd seen a Preston Pigeon and I said no, I said they're very evasive creatures, even though they've got a very seductive call and they coo very <laughs> seductively <laughs> very seductively, I've never actually seen one. And she went, Oh, that's a shame. It's like, yeah. Couldn't yeah. believe for a moment that she believed that there was pressure. Oh my god, that that's, works. That's fantastic. Like, uh, no, oh. I, I think some people just they, they buy into it far too easy, but no. <laughs> I mean I'm, i I I I was laughing watching that. I showed me Mrs. Oh Gail get, get on this. And she, <laughs> and Gail, get on and this. She's one. Is this legit? And I'm going, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm watching the face. Go, and this is the same guy off most all to doing this. And I'm like, <laughs> yep, <laughs> it is. Yeah. You know, and it was, it, you know, it, not a lot of people would do that for the for fear of ridicule and things like that. But no, you spot on. Absolutely brilliant. Um, Dr. O'Keefe, listen, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, thanks so much for putting up with. My, me going off on mad tangents, Morris going off on mad tangents, and just generally being a crack and bloke and no up for a laugh. Thanks very much. Good luck no, with you. And stay in touch. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.